Governor Newsom, welcome back to The Issue Is. Great to see you. Good to be back with you. So we are here in Gardena. You just signed legislation in terms of police decertification, an emotional event, yeah. and we saw some of the victims' families here. Yeah. What is the bottom line message you're trying to send to police officers with these series of bills? Uh, it's just about building trust. It's about building relationships, and it's about addressing abuses. And you know, look, if you're a police officer, the last thing you want to do is be associated with abuses. We have over 200 licenses in the state of California, uh, where if that license is suspended in one county, you can't then turn around and open up another practice in another county. But with police officers that may have committed some misconduct, they can go to another county, uh, rinse and repeat. And so that's changed. And if it works for you know, medical malpractice, it certainly should work for law enforcement as well. You know there was pushback along the way, which is why this was not the easiest bill to get done. No. What do you say to the critics who are concerned about due process, concerned about this process? Well, they got due process. I mean, the due process is the cornerstone of this bill, and it was amended, and I'll be honest with you, folks on the other side were upset that there were so many substantive due process amendments, but we believe in due process. Uh, that said, we don't want it to be abused either, and so look, it's all iteration. We were able to move something forward uh, 46 other states 46 had already moved forward so this is not a moment to spike the ball the question is what's wrong with California that it's not typically on leadership uh, position or in a leadership position on these things but look progress was made uh, but it means nothing unless we apply it fairly and judiciously and that's why we worked with law enforcement worked with advocates and as you suggest worked with the victims uh, particularly Kenneth Ross family that was right here a few years ago when they learned of their son's loss so a part of this is building trust in the african-american community is what they talked about today another thing you're doing today is about building trust in the african-american community which is Bruce's Beach yeah uh, the, the continuing the process of giving that back to the family what is the message you think that California is sending by doing that? That we may not always get it right, but we always have the opportunity every day we wake up to right wrongs, to improve, to iterate, to become better, to become more fully expressive of our proud past and our shameful past. I mean, the origins of racism that we apply so often today in our, our national discourse have embers all here in California, from the internment camps for the Japanese to the Chinese Exclusion Act that emanated out of the Bay Area in the 1880s. And, uh, and here we are trying to right these wrongs as it relates to systemic racism. And, uh, and this is a really remarkable story, Bruce's Beach. Uh, of being able to advance a cause in a substantive, not just symbolic way of doing something right to make up, you'll never make up for those wrongs, but to do it right in a meaningful, meaningful way. You know, California has begun the process of studying reparations. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that, and, and what does this moment say about that? I know there's a lot of anxiety around the reparations conversation, but I was proud to be the first governor in America to sign a reparations bill. In fact, the first task force meeting was last Friday. Um, and no one has a, a very specific or prescriptive answer to what reparations means. That's why we created the task force. They have a year uh, to engage and deliberate and then make recommendations to the legislature. The legislature will make subsequent recommendations before anything is codified. But this is, I think, important because you have the task force, which people thought was symbolic, but then you have the substance mm -hmm. of giving back to a family, at least a great-great-grand, uh, kids and their family members, uh, something that was taken from them for only one reason, the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. We just <laughs> got through this recall process, it's the first time I've talked to you yeah. since. What is your biggest takeaway from the recall? I, look, it, 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 the biggest takeaway, it was a zero-sum question. I mean, you're, it, it, there was no transition time, you're out of there, you're packing. Yeah. So it's an existential reality and you live with that dark cloud and I, you know, at least for me it was a dark cloud for over a year uh, with people with protest signs and recall signs and petitions out there in front of your house everywhere you go and so there's a stress associated with that but there wasn't a distraction associated with that and I want folks to know that we kept our eye on the ball and I think as a consequence we did well on election day because people saw we actually were moving the needle on the things that mattered to them housing homelessness education climate change addressing these great challenges that are all pre-existing challenges to not just the recall but even me getting elected two and a half years ago so my big takeaway is there's a deeper sense of urgency today than I've ever experienced in my lifetime that people really are frustrated and angry 
about Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. about City Hall, about the state capitol, about elected officials across the spectrum around institutions and not just governmental institutions. And people are demanding real results. And if you don't show them, you can't just assert it. You got to prove it. Then we're all going to be subject to subsequent recalls in the future. You won big, uh, and there are two different ways you could interpret those results. One, millions of people wanted to recall me, so maybe we should be conscious of that. Or two, yeah. millions more people didn't want to recall me, and we should double down on the policies. Wh which, how do you read it? I don't like a divided state. I don't like a divided nation. I really don't. I, I hope people. I mean, no one pays attention to what politicians say, but on election night, I try to keep my comments relatively short. I hope people go back to that. That was my heart. There was no script there. Um, I spoke on election night about, you know, our kids, and they're watching all this, this division, this consternation, the stress, the fact that you have politicians you're seeing on the debt ceiling in Washington, D.C., that just wake up every morning with a crowbar to put in the spokes of the wheel of the other party right. to trip everybody up. Uh, enough. Like, I have deep respect for people that supported the recall. Huh. Because I know they love their kids like I love my kids. I know they love their communities and their institutions, the places of worship, whatever it may be, that holds and binds us together as a community. And so I really want to find that. I'm, look, I'm in politics. I'm not naive. It, but at the same time, man, this just doesn't persist. We can't thrive if we're not thriving together. We may survive, but at what cost? So that's for me what I hope. That's for me my personal takeaway, but it's hope. I'm hoping that I could rise to another level in terms of the work I do to try to bring us together. Well, and to that point, I've always been curious about this. What do you tell your kids about the recall and about this moment in California I tell politics? them not to hate the people. I mean, they have, their, they have they, they, some of their best friends, parents, my kids' best friends, best friends, parents supported the recall. Hmm. And I'm like, don't let that get in the way of your relationship with your best friend and don't hate his parents because they're good people. We just see the world with a different set of eyes, but at the same time, we're there together in the, the barbecue after the soccer game, all sharing same experiences and, and, and same expression of, of love and, and, and relationship. Uh, and I honestly, I tell my kids this all the time because the worst thing could happen is being a kid of a politician mm -hmm. and you're just seeing this stress and consternation, the finger pointing, and I don't want them to have that, including Donald Trump. I made my kids many times come in. I'm not making this up and it's interesting that I'm even sharing it. I had many conversations, as many folks know, with Donald Trump on a consistent mm -hmm. basis. I didn't have a closed fist, I had an open hand. We disagreed across the spectrum, but I wanted to work with them. I had my kids come in and say, I'm gonna to talk to the president mom. I wanted them here that I can talk with civility to someone I vehemently disagree on a spectrum of issues. And I wanted them to understand that. And I'll tell you, of all the things I've done the last few years since I've been governor, in terms of trying to deal with the challenges and stresses my kids have as, with their dad being a governor, I'm most proud of that because it's interestingly had an impact on them that they talk, when they see Trump, they go, they don't say, I hate him anymore. Mm. They say, you know, I'm glad he's gone. We love President Biden. <laughs> but there's, but there, the temperature's taken down. And that's all we need. So, you don't have to hate everybody. So, you can disagree. You don't have to hate. So they're literally in the room while you're on the phone yeah, with them? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And speaking of kids, uh, we see you have a new kids book coming out uh, uh, talking about ha. your dyslexia. As of, this is hot off the press this morning. I know. Exclusive. That's how we it like it here. exclusive. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that this is something a lot of people don't know about you, which I think actually just explains you more if people <laughs> got, got to understand that. Something that I think is really an interesting aspect of your life. Can you talk for a moment about how dyslexia has has shaped you and, well, and what you're trying to accomplish with this book. One of the, the biggest frustrations people have with me is like, gee, he keeps talking and talking and he goes from one issue to, yeah. it's because I don't, I, I have a difficult time even to this day reading. And, and when I do read, even comprehend, I have to go over uh, when I'm reading multiple times. I have pretty severe dyslexia and it really marked uh, a relationship with me with having to find ways to overcompensate and deal with the deep issues and stresses of self-esteem because you don't have much when kids are laughing at other kids because they can't read. I had to go through speech therapy for years. I found all these old files yeah. uh, that my mom kept and after she passed away I found them in boxes uh, that explained and expressed old years and years and years of supplemental support that uh, she was able to provide for me. So I did a little kids book talking about, well, a young child proxy, I guess me, um, hmm. that 
not only had a relationship to dyslexia, but to sports because I literally, not for baseball, not for basketball, uh, I wouldn't have had self-esteem and I could have been in a very different place. And so how sports created a sense of confidence that I was able to translate, ultimately try to overcome the dyslexia. And so it's a little children's book, a picture book. There are not many out there for dyslexic kids. In fact, I couldn't find one. And I have two kids with learning differences myself. And so I decided to write one and I'm really excited it's coming out in December. And for people that might not know, the governor was a baseball star at Santa Clara. And if he hadn't blown out well, his arm, maybe <laughs> he would be doing that instead of well, this. Well, I don't know if a baseball star, but, but it got me into college. It's yeah. interesting, for, more important than anything else. I was going in, and no shame in this, I was quite literally going to junior college, right, out of, out of high school, uh, until folks came knocking, and I got a very small baseball scholarship, but it got me in a four-year college, changed my life. But again, that's sports, and that's why I'm very reverential about sports. Right. Some people think, well, it's, why it's the big deal. To me, it's, it's so much more than the activities on the field. It's the activities off the field, the discipline, the teamwork. Governor, congrats on the book. Congrats on the uh, recall win, and, and great to see you. Good to see you. Thank All you. right. Thank you very much. <laughs>